Hello everyone, I'm the Catholic Bible Geek. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome to what's actually another installment of our gospel study through the book of John, or, or the book of John is like the gospel of a fanboy. I've been doing these series of live streams, but we got up to the point in chapter 6, at the end of chapter 6, in which Jesus is going to go into the bread of life discourse. And I thought, let me try to do this or present it in a different way, a slightly different format, so I can release it as its own recorded video, so that it'll get a little bit more traction, a little more readily accessible for people who want to share and whatnot. So we left off last time at uh, verse 22, John chapter 6, verse 22. And just to reiterate what's going on here, we, we talked about in the last live stream video, but Jesus, we know from the other Gospels at this point, he's just heard about John the Baptist's arrest. So he's heard about his cousin's arrest. And he goes off uh, to, to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. He is teaching and preaching there. The people are following him. He does take mercy on them, multiply the loaves and fishes to feed them. But then he goes up into the hilltop to be alone. He, you know, he constantly goes to, away to be alone for prayer, usually on hilltops and whatnot, uh, to, to, be, to be alone in prayer with God. He, this is a difficult time for him. At that point in the night, he, he realizes that he sent his disciples on ahead because he, he wanted to be alone. So at that point in the night, he looks down and sees all the crowds there who are still after him. And as we're going to find out, those crowds are only there seeking a sign. They just want his miracles. They're not there to to uh, really listen to his message and accept him on the, as the Messiah on his terms, not on the terms that they want it. So, uh, so he doesn't go down. Instead, he just simply walks across the water, as we saw in the last st uh, story, and uh, kind of freaks out the disciples a little bit there, but gets in the boat with them and goes across. Now, the next morning, the crowds... They don't see him anywhere. They, they get in their boats and they sail back. And when they sail back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee there, and that's where their home base, the other uh, area is just kind of more mountainous and whatnot. So uh, kind of where you would go to be alone or to teach. So they go back to the other side of Galilee, to Capernaum there, and see where he is there. And they find him there and they say, how did you get back? You know, what did you do? Uh, you know, we, why, we, why didn't we see you? So that, I'm going to pick up that in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them. Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And he says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him has God the Father set his seal. What he's saying here is that you didn't come seeking signs of a Messiah. You came because you got something from me. You got something from me and you want to be close to me because you think that I'm going to bestow these gifts and, and take back Israel from the Romans and all the things that, that people thought the, the Messiah would do. And Jesus says, I'm here to give you food, which uh, not food which perishes, but food which endures to eternal life. This is what the Son of Man does. He's calling himself the Son of Man. That is a language, a reference from the book of Daniel, Daniel's prophecy about the Messiah. So every time Jesus calls himself Son of Man, that's saying, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one that, that Daniel prophesied about when he said, one like unto the Son of Man appeared. And he says, uh, then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? So they, they, they say, look, well, all right, what do we do then? What do we do? We want to be in God's will. What do we do? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. All right, in him who he has sent, not in whom you were hoping he would send. In other words, Believe me in the things I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying to you. Stop trying to assume or to coerce me into being what you want me to be as the Messiah. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Okay, so they say, fine, okay. If you, but if you are the Messiah, then what continuous sign are you going to give? Moses, you know, the Messiah is supposed to be one unlike one like unto Moses will be lifted up. So Moses gave the people, gave the Israelites in the, in the desert manna to eat. You know, and Moses is leading the Israelites through the desert from their captivity in Egypt to the promised land. Ultimately, it took them a while to get there because God had to prepare them and, and weed out a lot of uh, disobedience in them. So a few generations in. But at some point in the desert, the people of Israel were grumbling in Exodus. And they were, did you just lead us out here to, to, to let us starve? You know, there's no food out here in the desert. And, uh, and Moses, God told Moses, okay, I'm going to rain down bread from heaven. And it was this manna that was going to show up 
every morning this bread that they could eat, but it would only show up enough as what they needed. They couldn't gather up extra, unless it was for the Sabbath, in which day they weren't supposed to go out and work and gather, but uh, they couldn't take more than they needed. It was, it was a lesson in God's providence. God will provide for you daily. He will give you that daily bread, right? So this is what they're asking. They said, look, you know, you fed us the other day, you know, but manna happened every single morning. So if you're the Messiah, if you're the one like Moses that's going to be gathered up or, or going to be um, risen up again, what are you? What what sign do you give us? What daily sign do you give us? This is very important because this is leading into this bread of life discourse that Jesus is going to talk about. But Jesus answers them and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Okay, so the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They say, Lord, give us this bread always. All right, sounds good. We're in. Give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have, that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and him who comes to me I will not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay, so there's a lot of theological stuff going on there, but I'm just going to try and stick to the bread of life discourse because we could do months and weeks just in this chapter. You know, you can go deep like that into the scripture, especially John's gospel. Jesus is saying, I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. And instead of, you know, when they say, what are the works of God? What must we do? Jesus doesn't say, okay, um, love your neighbor as yourself and love God, you know, love God with all your heart and then love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't go quoting Micah. He doesn't do any of these things. He says, believe in me. Because Jesus here is trying to, they're saying, what do we do? Moses gave a law. Moses gave 10 commandments and then provided manna. So give us your law and then provide for us. That's what they're asking. Do like Moses. Jesus says, instead of a law, instead of a system of rules, he says, you need to believe in me first. Because as we know, salvation is by grace, through faith. But that's not the end of it. Then you have to walk with me. Remaining in that grace, remaining in that walk of salvation is an act of love. It's, it's living out the laws that are there, that, that do show that you're in that relationship with Christ. That's how you grow in holiness, you increase in holiness. So Jesus says these things and reiterates it and says, you know, belief in me causes these things. The Father's giving these, uh, these, these gifts to me and I, and I will raise those up in the last day. They'll not be sent to death. So the people, the Jews then murmured at him, verse 41, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does then he say, I have to come down from heaven? All right, so now here's the thing. When we're going to get into some of the, the end of this chapter here, the Bread of Life Discourse, the denominational debate is whether this is metaphorical or literal. When Jesus is saying things like, my body is, is uh, bread, my, my blood is, is drink. Throughout this passage, Jesus is being both metaphorical and literal, as we will see. Hyperbole is in the Bible. Jesus does use hyperbole. Jesus does speak in, uh, in metaphors many times and parables and such. But we're going to see that you can't just paint this passage with a broad brush. That's not what works here. And as we get into this uh, this passage here and get into a bit more of it, some of this stuff, a lot of Protestants just never heard. They just never read these portions of the Bible. It was never really taught to them. Or when they did read it, they just kind of skimmed over it with an assumption. I'm speaking from my own experience as a Protestant who converted to the Catholic Church. So this is where I want to kind of go from here on out in my own experience of this. So they said to him, Okay, how does he say he comes from heaven? So Jesus said, I am the bread of life who came down from heaven. This is metaphor. Okay, they know that. And they recognize he's speaking in metaphor to us. Their problem isn't that he's the metaphorical bread of God. They're saying, how can he say he came down from heaven? We know his parents. You know, we know he was born uh, of Mary. And, you know, we know that. So they don't understand that. So they understand the metaphor here. They just don't understand how it's a metaphor. And Jesus answered them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one came to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. So basically he says, if people come to belief in me, it's by the Father. The Holy Spirit draws them to me. 
this it's by the will of the Father that people come to belief in me. So I, you know, you're not going to get these uh, these uh, you know this this logical reason beyond all shadow of a doubt that'll convince you. Uh, no, it is written of the prophets. This is verse uh, 45. Yeah, verse 45. And they shall be all taught by God. Every one who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that any one has seen the Father except him who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Okay, again, a lot more, a lot of uh, theological stuff in there. We're not going to get into so much. We're going to keep going here. This is uh, verse 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. Okay, so if you're going to go the metaphorical route, you could probably still be in that vein here. He's saying that, that I am the bread, and the, and the bread that I'm going to give you is my flesh, you could say, okay, well, yeah, he's offering up his flesh on the cross. Well, let's keep going. The Jews then disputed amongst themselves, saying, how can this man give us flesh to eat? All right, this is, this is concerning the Jews a little bit, because Jesus, they perceive, he was talking in metaphor, now he's being kind of literal. He's saying that he's going to give you his flesh to eat. Now, in their minds, they're thinking about Leviticus and the laws that Jesus gave. And are the, God gave in the, in the Old Testament. In Leviticus 17, verse 10, If any man of the house of Israel or any of the strangers that sojourn among them eats any blood, I will set my face uh, against that person who eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life. So God told the uh, Israelites in the Old Testament, you, you can't eat blood. If today, you know, Jews who eat kosher meals, that meat has to be thoroughly washed and then cooked, you know, to, to, uh, to perfection. And, you know, there's no such thing as a, as a rare steak, you know, in kosher, kosher feet, moods, uh, foods. But that was, as, as God said in the Old Testament, because the life of the blood, life is in the blood, and that life is the symbol of atonement on the altar. So God wanted that blood being an offering, not something that they would consume, because it's imperfect. It's even imperfect as a sacrifice, but the Old Testament sacrifices were were pictures of Christ's sacrifice ultimately. And Christ just said, I'm not the flesh like you put a dead bull on the altar. I'm the living bread. Living bread. We'll get back to that in a second. So this is what they're thinking, and this is why they're murmuring. The Jews disputed amongst themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, okay, so just want to back up here and, and set this again. They understood he was talking in metaphor when he said, I am the bread of life, come down from heaven. Now he's talking about giving them his flesh to eat, and they're thinking, is he being literal? That's, we're not supposed to do that, okay? That's the reaction they should have, right? Is it, faithful, uh, faithful Jews in this day. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Look at what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say, no, it's, it's a metaphor, guys. I don't mean literally you're going to eat my flesh. Of course, Deuteronomy or Leviticus you know, is against that. Of course not. No, this is what I'm trying to say. No, he doesn't clear that up at all. In fact, he doubles down on it. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He continues, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay, so now he's talked about those who believe in me shall be raised up at the last day. They won't, they won't perish. They'll have eternal life. Now he's adding on to that. It's not just believing in Jesus. It's those who eat my flesh and drink my blood. Those people. That's what, it ta that's what belief causes. Belief in me causes the works and obedience to my, to my commands. And that is eating my flesh and drinking my blood. Continuing. Get even more, more literal and more extreme about it. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. This is John chapter 6, verse 55. In other words, to anybody who says he's speaking in metaphor here, Jesus would answer you, For my flesh is food indeed, not in metaphor, indeed, and my blood is drink 
indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. I'm not going to give you manna. I'm going to give you my flesh to eat. And it's going to give you life. Now, they hadn't, Jesus hadn't instituted the Eucharist yet. So they didn't know exactly what he means. But Jesus is being very bold and very, very blatant here. And you might say, well, if he didn't give them the Eucharist yet, then how could they, how could they possibly stick with that? And we're going to see their responses here. In verse 60, many of his disciples, when they heard it, said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at it, said to them, do you take offense at this? All right, again, what does Jesus say to them? They're murmuring about this. They're saying, who can listen to this? Isn't this blasphemy? Jesus doesn't say, guys, no, no, I'm talking metaphorically. No, no, literally not going to eat my flesh. Obviously, that's it. No, no. He says, he says this, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? What if you saw me ascending into heaven? Which they will, right? Disciples that remain anyway. It is in the spirit that gives life. The flesh is to no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And there are some of you that do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who those were that did not believe and who it was that would, not be, that would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. So again, this is difficult words. These are spiritual words that I'm giving you. You're going to need the Holy Spirit to understand what I'm saying to you. And only the Holy Spirit, only the Father is going to draw you to me. And no one can come to me and believe in these things unless he's drawn by the Father. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer walked with him. Okay, so this isn't necessarily talking about the 12. Jesus was always followed by tons of his disciples. He chose the 12 to be his, his, his main crew there that he was teaching and, and uh, training to be the apostles eventually. But he had many, many more disciples than that. And, and at this, after this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer walked with him. These are disciples that had been there learning from his teaching, believing in him as the Messiah, trying to learn what kind of Messiah he was going to be. Okay, These were not just the crowds who were following for, for something, a sign or something he could give them. These are actual disciples. And they leave him because he's talking about eating flesh and drinking blood. Jesus doesn't stop them and say, guys, guys, don't walk away from this. No, you've been with me for all this time. Don't, don't, don't leave me over just a misunderstanding about what I'm saying metaphorically. No, he doesn't. In fact, what does he do? Then Jesus turns around to the 12 and says, will you also go away? He's not clarifying this. He's not saying this is metaphor. He looks at these 12 disciples and says, so are you going to leave too? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know you. You are the Holy One of God. Peter says, I don't get it. <laughs> Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about. But where else are we going to go? We are going to be here because you said this. And, and, uh, and, and we know you. you know, we know you're the Holy One of God. We know you're the Messiah. Don't really know what you're talking about here, but we're not going to walk away because of it. And then they will. Of course, they will know what God is, what Jesus is talking about there because at the Last Supper, and we'll get to that when we get to that, Jesus institutes the Eucharist. Jesus, again, hands them the bread. He breaks the bread and blesses it and tells them now, this is my body and gives it to them. So literally, quite literally, he said here, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. My blood is real drink. My flesh is real uh, bread. It's real food indeed not metaphorical. It re is real. And then at the Last Supper, he actually breaks bread, blesses it, and gives it to them and says, now this, this is my body. Not, not grab some bread over there and, uh, and, and, and symbolically eat it as though you're going to symbolically, you know, partake of my, my life and suffering. No, this bread that I blessed, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you in this cup of wine. The, 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 the early Christians believed this. They believed in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, that when Jesus appoints his apostles, they then had the power to do that as well, to, to break that bread and say, this is, this is Jesus' body broken for you and hand it to you. And in that moment, you partake of the real flesh of Jesus. You partake of the real blood of Jesus, the living flesh and living blood, you know, resurrected flesh there. 
and that it, in doing so, you receive life, because in, in doing so, you are receiving the fruit of the tree of life. Jesus came back to redeem all that went lost. Adam was cast out of a garden. Jesus goes back into the garden of Gethsemane. Adam was cast out to earn his living by earn his food by the sweat of his brow. Jesus goes into the garden of Gethsemane and prays like great droplets of sweat, like of blood falling to the ground. And then Jesus, Adam was cast out from the tree. Jesus goes to the tree and hung on the tree, and he becomes the fruit of the tree of life. His body is the bread of life. This is the bread of life discourse. This is what he's saying. This is what the Eucharist is, St. Irenaeus. St. Irenaeus, who was the follower of Polycarp, who was the follower of John the Apostle, who wrote this gospel, who wrote the gospel we're studying right now. He himself wrote numerous occasions about how the real presence is in that, that Eucharist. Do not, do not believe those who tell you it's just a symbol. This is, this is you know, no more than 100 years or so. I mean, you've got St. Irenaeus. This would be, I think, 2nd or 3rd century this is like one generation removed from the Apostle John himself. How quickly does, did, uh, did uh, you know, do you think Jesus' church that he left behind suddenly just start to deteriorate? deteriorate. This, is, um, this is a belief that goes back to the very beginning, to the earliest fathers of the church that we know, the earliest Christians that we know. They believed this and warned against people who would try to say that it's, it's just a metaphor. So when I read this as a Protestant, I started to, you know, I used to read it and think, yeah, Jesus is telling those, those people who are following him, just seeking a sign or just seeking what he can give for them. He's saying, no, no, you guys need to really listen to what I'm telling you. I'm this kind of Messiah. And uh, metaphorically, you eat my bread and uh, eat my uh, flesh and drink my blood. And metaphorically, that's just, you know, kind of you, you suffering or taking part in the suffering that I do by denying yourself and, and uh, you know, denying the world. Then I realized when you look at the language, when Jesus says, the, you, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. At first, when he says eat there in the Greek, it's, it's, a, it's a more civilized term, more, more like something we would say like consume. After they start giving him some pushback, when Jesus gets very and doubles down on it there, so truly, truly, I say to you, my flesh is real flesh, and my blood, uh, flesh is real bread, and unless you eat of my flesh, he changes the word he uses there in Greek. The word he uses for eat there becomes to gnaw or to chew. It's a very common word. It's a very... Uh, word that you like beasts would use like when they eat or they feed in greek jesus changes to this word to emphasize yes he's doubling down on it no, not only shall you consume my flesh but you must chew it that's what he's saying i'm not just talking about taking it in i'm talking about chewing it with your teeth unless you do that then you have no life in you and i started to realize that and thought wow jesus isn't telling the these jews here that they misunderstand him He's telling me that I misunderstand him. Now, I was a Protestant, an act, a Christian, believed in Christ, had accepted Christ as my Savior, and I was saved. And, and, uh, and, and if I you know, had died in that moment, then there's no doubt that I would have gone to heaven because I, my conscience was clear. I was doing everything that I thought God wanted me to. So when I say that, you know, I'm quoting Jesus' words here, unless you eat my bread, uh, flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you, that isn't to say that anybody who's a Protestant and doesn't convert to Catholicism and partake of the Eucharist is, uh, is, is not saved or not going to heaven. We do know that, that God saves who he will, right? I mean, they tell to the thief on the cross next to him, this day you will be with me in paradise. And that thief certainly never uh, was able to, to partake of the Eucharist. So it's not, it's not that if you fail to have this belief, then you are not saved. But Jesus didn't leave behind a book. He left behind a church. He left behind teachings and traditions, which the apostles gave to their followers, who gave to their followers. This is why we have them from St. Irenaeus, from St. Justin the Martyr, and uh, all of these different early church fathers and saints confirming all of these teachings and traditions that were passed down to them long before the Bible, the canon of the Bible, ever came to be, or was ever circulated and everybody could have a copy. Long before that, it was the church that handed these things down. St. Saint, um, John Henry Newman, Cardinal, Cardinal Newman had a quote, a wonderful quote. He said, to something to the effect of, to delve into church history is to cease to be Protestant. This was absolutely my experience. If you stop just being content with what you yourself are comfortable with, what you yourself are comfortable with the Bible saying, you know, I'm comfortable with this interpretation of the Bible, I'm comfortable that my pastor... Uh, 
says this. If you, if you stop being content with that, don't deny it. Don't just, you know, throw it away. But you go deeper into scripture and deeper into study of church history. Okay, well, if God, if Jesus did set up, did leave that church, and if he said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, then I should be able to go look at the, at the early Christians' writings and, and see a world and a belief that reflects my own, my own here in 2021. When you do that, though, you see an early church that is undeniably Roman Catholic. You know, Roman Catholicism wasn't a thing yet in terms of, of Roman Catholicism, because that wasn't until the, the, uh, the Roman Empire was, was, you know, became Christian. But Christianity's there, and it is Catholic. It is, it is, it is undeniably Catholic. So, yeah, when uh, John Har Carl Newman said to, um, to dive into church history is to cease to be Protestant, know exactly what he's talking about. That was my experience 100%. And as this passage is an example for us, when you, when you dig into the scripture like this and, and you know, you, and I've read it, that passage and you can try and, and make it metaphorically and every, every next verse you get, you say, okay, okay. So he's just talking metaphor there. Then the very next verse he gets, he hits you with, and I mean it truly, indeed, <laughs> you know, my, my flesh is bread and you must consume it. I, you know, you, you just, you can't see it any other way when you take the Bible on its own. And you look at the church history, which does corroborate it. So that's all I have for now. Uh, a bit of a long study, certainly a long standalone video. But for those who do like to follow along with the Bible study, it's here. I'll try to probably cut out some of these um, moments as their own little videos here and there, maybe if I can. But that's all for now. Hope you have a great weekend. Hope you, uh, yeah, just hope you uh, live well and may God bless.